behind every addiction so many times is mental health. Today, Dr. McElrath from Unity Point joins us to talk about mental health issues live on Restoring Hope. Restoring Hope, open my heart to sing, taking the darkness inside, revealing your light, restoring hope, open my eyes to see, see the world through different Welcome. It's another edition of the National Restoring Hope Live program brought to you by the good folks at Unity Point uh, here across our land. Uh, my guest host, or my co-host, I'm sorry, is the lovely Lila Stafford, who just got back from three weeks living on the beach in Florida. Yeah. Did you have fun? Absolutely. Did you want to come home? No. <laughs> Every other vacation I've wanted to come home. And this one, I just did not want to come. And then we were greeted with the wonderful snowstorm. Yeah. When did you get in? 10 yesterday morning. Oh, my. Oh, my. And uh, Bob Montserrat, the cat in the hat who watches our chat. So if you jump on webcast1live.com, you can participate in the show by asking questions or making comments on the chat. Now, Bob, for 34 years in real life, was a forensic scientist with the state of Iowa. And is one of the most sought after experts to testify in cases where alcohol is an issue. Did I say that right? Over 35 years. Oh. And sure, alcohol. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Bob has a wonderful understanding of drugs and alcohol and uh, not from firsthand uh, uh, experience like uh, Lila and I do, but certainly uh, by being a forensic scientist. And our special guest today is Dr. McElrath. Mm -hmm. Did I say that right? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry if I get it wrong. I do the best I can. You ought to see how I have it spelled, just so <laughs> I can... I'm a radio guy. We're not bright, you know, we're not very learned. Oh. So if I write everything out, um, what do they call that? Phonetically, Phonetically. I'll say it right every time. And you are a psychiatrist. Yes. With Unity Point. Mm -hmm. And you uh, told me you help, uh, like helping people with mental diseases. Yes, I do. Why? I just find it so rewarding to, to help people with their challenges, with depression and anxiety. Um, those are sometimes, I think, illnesses that get overlooked or kind of cast aside by other specialties. So I find that very rewarding. I think our society people. does, too. I mean, they, they kind of push it aside, like, just, you know, can't you just be happy or... Mm -hmm. um, the anxiety that no one wants to be around that. Do you, do you, I just want to ask this real quick. Cause I, we get a, a lot of people that come to us with dual diagnosis, anxiety and depression is the other thing besides alcoholism or, mm -hmm. um, drugs. Do you ever treat those with amino acids the just to get their body back in, um, you know, after they've been drinking for a while, their body's just always, I, I, I am not scientific, so it's just my understanding here. Their body's just really messed up from the drugs and alcohol. And I know there's some therapists in town who treat that uh, why the, when they're first getting sober with amino acids just to get their body back in balance to figure out what it is they do. You know, if they really do have anxiety, um, kind of clear out their body first and mm -hmm. then see. Do you, do you ever... Do you know anything about that or have you heard of that before? There are some things we routinely do like um, supplement with B vitamins or folic acid. Uh, amino acids um, in particular, I haven't seen much research supporting or refuting that use Yeah, to help get their body back in balance. Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what St. Gregory's does? Yes, they do. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, St. Gregory's was a place that uh, uh, we were associated with for a while and uh, then decided to unassociate. And because um, uh, we find that 12-step programs are the best. Mm -hmm. uh, there really isn't any magical pill or magical drug that you can give to an alcoholic or an addict. It's just the surrendering and, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with life on life's terms. But I do, I do think you, ha you really have... 
for certain people that works really well but i will tell you that you do have to deal with the anxiety and depression somehow yeah because the, until that's under control people can't stay sober exactly we have to work to break that cycle yeah uh, in some place and with multiple avenues if we need to with the 12 step program and sometimes medications are needed yes. also yeah all right talk to me like i'm a whoops talk to me like i'm a 6 year old okay explain how mommy is suffering from this thing called depression is that fair is that a fair question sure well, I, I would say in very simple terms that depression is something that um, can be very bio, chemical, chemically based in your brain, um, an imbalance in the chemicals in your brain that can lead to you feeling less energetic, sad all the time, crying, not sleeping well or sleeping too much, not eating well or eating too much. So if, uh, if I make mommy happy... Because she'll laugh when I play my accordion. I'm a six-year-old. Play my flute. Oh, no, no flute. <laughs> play my spoons. Then I should play my spoons all the time because then I can help make mommy happy. It's definitely not unusual for people who have overreaching depression to still have periods of happiness and still feel mm -hmm. happy when things happen in their lives, but they just have kind of a general color of depression over everything that they typically do so there's nothing really that i can do as her six-year-old son to help mommy be happy and not be sad we do know that getting out uh, with other people getting outside getting sunshine being social those things can help improve depression but sometimes it's it's that chemical imbalance that needs to be treated with a medication how do you know then um it just seems to me that when when people are being treated for anxiety or depression, it's like this hit or miss thing with, with medication, and and every you know you give them something and it takes a while for it to start working, and it just, and then everyone's hanging around to see if it works or not. I mean, it just. Do you feel like, like you have a, a real sense of what somebody needs when they come and talk to you, or, or are you trying out? different medications to see if they're working? Some patients um, that I see, it, they have a lot going on in their lives and it mm -hmm. can be easy to see that they're stressed and that it's situationally based with, with what they've got going on. And so mm -hmm. we maybe try to focus a little bit more on therapy or those behavioral things that they can do, getting out with their friends, getting outside, exercise. Um, but some people have no reason to be depressed mm -hmm. per se and those typically maybe we think it's more on that chemical side that they need the medication to correct do you the think imbalance. that food has anything to do with how people feel do you think that that chemically sets you up if they're eating the wrong kinds of foods I know I'm clear out there with these questions, but I just... Um, you mean like a sugar diet, high sugar diet, yeah. And carbs? Yeah. Does that affect depression or anxiety? In, in a roundabout way, maybe I think so. Mm -hmm. um, we know that food can be an addiction like anything else. Yeah. And in that way, it could lead to depression just like any other addiction. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you kind of get in that same cycle with as as if they were abusing alcohol or something like that. But yeah. um, as far as the nutrient content of their diet promoting depression, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Okay. What are some of the, uh, by the way, our guest today is Dr. McElrath. She is a clinical psychiatrist. Is mm -hmm. that the right word? Yep, yep. Unity Point uh, did her medical school at uh, Des Moines University, did her residency up in Sioux Falls, and uh, graduated from North High School. Yeah. And has a wonderful husband who is a stay-at-home dad with uh, two little girls, three-year-old and... Nine months. Nine months. Any, yep. more, any more coming? Uh, not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> You're in control of that. Uh, and don't ever let your husband think he is because he's wrong. Um, you say a chemical imbalance. Can you name those chemicals or is it just a mishmash of everything that goes into our head? 
everything works together in your brain, of course. All the chemicals impact other chemicals. But the usual target for antidepressant medication is serotonin. Okay. Serotonin levels seem to be too low in people who have depression or anxiety. Um, newer medications are targeting other chemicals like dopamine and norepinephrine also. Okay, I'm, I'm just writing these down. What was the last one you said? Norepinephrine. Nora? Norepinephrine. It's also called adrenaline. Oh, well, I'm just going to put adrenaline then because I know what that is. So um, the people don't have enough of that? Is that what you're saying? Patients don't? They don't have enough serotonin, it seems like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then increasing the levels of the norepinephrine or adrenaline can help with the energy and motivation. Where does serotonin come from? I mean, what part of my body produces it? It's primarily uh, produced in your brain. You also okay. have some in your GI tract. And, and what would lessen, what would I do or not do that would lessen my brain producing the correct level of serotonin that I need? I'm not sure that anything you would do would cause your brain to produce less or more serotonin. All right. So drinking alcohol wouldn't. Well, we do know that alcohol works as a depressant on the brain. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then if you have too much of it, it's not making it. it your, your body's always trying to balance itself. Mm -hmm. So if you're drinking too much, then your body's trying to make up for, for that. And then if you quit, I think your body isn't making as much maybe as it, as it did at one time. Yeah. Um, there are a tremendous amount of uh, medications out there, uh, antidepressant drugs that uh, better uh, than others. Are there more advanced ones that we see coming out? Is this a market that will constantly improve itself? Or at some point, you know, this is the best we got. Well... There are a few brand new uh, antidepressant drugs coming out on the market. For a long time, they were all in the same class, and they were just slightly different drugs. Um, there's not a lot of money that, uh, that pharmaceutical companies are making in developing new antidepressants. So the wow, development really? has been kind of slow. I, but isn't everybody on one? An antidepressant? I mean, not everybody, but isn't there a tremendous amount of the population? Quite a few, yeah. I mean, I would think that would be uh, a place where drug companies would invest money for research and development, but not so much, huh? It hasn't seemed that way, no. Now, isn't Paxil? Mm -hmm. That's an antidepressant. Yep. And Paxil's one of the early ones you would try. Is that correct? It's been around for a very long time. Uh, personally, I don't try it first because people typically have a lot of side effects to that one. Like what are the side effects to Paxil? Stomach upset, headache. Um, if you miss your dose even by a couple hours, you can start to feel sick. Really? Hmm. Uh, uh, go ahead. As far as efficacy goes, uh, research has shown us that the drugs are pretty much all uh, the same amount effective. What differs is people's personal responses and side effects mm -hmm. to the medication. Yeah. Efficacy, what is that? How effective the drug is going to be for somebody. Okay. Wow. We're learning some big words here today. Are you hanging with me? I, I knew it's that It's bigger one. than six-year-old words. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you. Yeah, because efficacy, um, that would be the kind of pizza I could get at Casey's. I'd get an effie <laughs> uh, at Casey's. All right. We're going to take our first break. And uh, Dr. McElrath, I sure appreciate you being here. And, uh, of course, it's nice to have you home, uh, Lila. And uh, uh, Bob, nice to have you back. And Ryan, nice to have you producing. Uh, when we come back, you know, I, I don't, uh, I think the good Lord uh, put me through in my life what he did so I can share it with you. And uh, you can know that you're not alone. And maybe it can help you. Uh, understand a brother or sister or friend or pastor or somebody you work with, maybe why they're a little bubble off plum, you know, a little, I don't know, uncorked. Uh, we'll talk about a couple things that uh, I suffer from, and I'm interested in getting Dr. McElrath's uh, feedback. If she tells me I'm really nuts, I may begin to weep, but mm -hmm. that's okay. We can do that live on the radio.
here on the truth. Yeah, the truth. I love it. 99.3, powered by webcast1live.com. A father who is headed toward another heart attack. A woman who struggles daily with diabetes and her memory. A boy whose headaches keep him out of school. A mother who one morning discovers a lump. A girl whose condition defies diagnosis. You come to us because you need answers, but you also need more. You need understanding of what you're going through. You need comfort. You need to be treated as an individual, not a condition. You need to be included in your own care. You are the point of everything we do. That's why we're changing to Unity Point Health. It's a model of care that will help us work better together, where the physician who knows you best takes the lead, coordinating your care through every step, from the hospital to specialists, to rehabilitation, to health services in the home and in the community, to making sure the treatments are effective. By working as a team, we surround you with care, helping you manage your health and your conditions, guiding you to making better choices and living a healthier life. The point of unity is you. Unity Point Health. Hey, psst. Let me let you in on a little secret. You ready? Always try to do business with people not places, especially if you seek honest Christian business people. And when it comes to my car, I really need to trust who's working on it. Now, my family is so blessed. A few years ago, we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open, honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart. And it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car. Everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you. And tell them Max sent you. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One. Restoring hope, open my heart to sing, taking the darkness inside, revealing your light, restoring hope. Welcome, this is Restoring Hope Live, a ministry supported by Unity Point Hospitals across the land, trying to help people with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Not just limited to drugs or alcohol. Today we have a mental health specialist, a mental health clinical psychiatrist from Unity Point, Dr. McElrath. Lila is strictly in uh, alcohol and drugs. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, but you do. you have to understand mental health. I mean... Yeah, I'm well, yeah, you have to a little yeah. bit, but not to the extent that she does. Right. <laughs> and Bob Monster at the Cat in the Hat uh, watching the chat. You can log on to Webcast One Live and uh, ask us a question uh, through the chat. You can also call in at 244 0077. That's area code 515. If you're watching this on a podcast, needless to say, there's nobody watching the phones. So if you're watching it live, we'd love to hear from you. All right. Uh, the last time I asked a mental health specialist about the uh, mental disorder that I was diagnosed with many years ago and am now supposedly in, well, I am. I'm in, I'm in uh, uh, not matrician. Remission. 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 Thank you. Um, it was Jerry, and I think he came like three weeks in a row because he fascinated yeah. me so. And one of the reasons that I like talking about 
uh, uh, my borderline is because it is one of those, uh, and I know if I'm wrong, tell me, but it's one of those that you can't deal with medicines. There's no medicines to work on borderline. No, therapy is definitely the primary way to address borderline personality. Um, sometimes people get some relief from antidepressant medicines or medicines that help kind of even out mood. Well, I've been on Cymbalta mm -hmm. for many years now. Many years. And I think before that I was on Paxil. Paxil. And, um, but I, well, first of all, explain to me as you know it, what borderline personality disorder is? Well, the way I explain it to my patients is that everybody is born or develops certain personality traits that work for them in some way, but sometimes um, they don't function really well uh, in society or, or work so well for that person in their personal relationships and things like that. So the trick is for us to, first of all, kind of figure out what those traits are, and sometimes they fall into a common pattern um, that we have a name for, a diagnosis for, like borderline personality. And then um, we talk about how we can work to make those traits function better for them in their personal lives and in their lives in general. So that's how I explain that. Yeah, very good. Good. So what would be some of the uh, personality traits of someone you would categorize as a borderline? Uh, to having lots of mood swings throughout the day, feeling angry or even crying. At, at Quiet. The... Don't you talk to me anymore, <laughs> Lila. I see you looking at me. I told you I was going to cry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Swings like that, having a history of unstable personal relationships, feeling like um, making friends very, making and losing friends very quickly or that sort of thing. Um, being afraid of being alone, feeling like they don't have an identity or they feel yeah. empty. Yeah, one of the things that always triggered with me was I had a fear of abandonment. Mm -hmm. And I was probably going to abandon you uh, before uh, you were going to abandon me. Exactly. And therefore, the uh, burning of a bridge never thought twice about it when it came to relationships. Why would I want to keep the relationship in a place that could be restored. Yeah. Black and white thinking can also be a feature. <laughs> Seeing people as all good or all bad. Bingo. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so I guess my question is, does a person like Mac know that that is his problem? Now, I'm assuming, Mac, you didn't know that until they labeled you, correct? Um. Well... <laughs> I have been in therapy all of my life. Very, I, I bet I would not go six months until I'd find a new therapist. And then guess what? They would be wrong, and so I would quit. As I look back on those people now, I, I think they were very good at understanding my behavior. I think I was just very difficult to get attention. Uh, to, 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 let me back up that it was very difficult for me to trust them. Um, and because uh, I'd push. I mean, that was, the, that was the most active playground of my borderline was that 58 minutes in a counselor's office. Because as far as I w was concerned, uh, no offense meant, please. Mm -hmm. This is fair game. This, this man thinks he's here to help me. Okay, we're going to go to town. And I never lied. You know, I don't, I, I, I made, in fact, if I'd say something that was untrue, I'd back it up or I'd come back in the next week and say, hey, that thing I told you wasn't true. Because I wanted him uh, or her to absolutely have the best information they could to help me. Because um, six, 11, so 12 years ago was when I finally found the therapist that diagnosed me for the first time with that label. And I'm not offended by the label, by the way. Uh, and then sent me through six years of almost weekly sessions. And it was December of 09 that he told me uh, at the end of a session in December of 09, he stood up, gave me a big hug, and he said, I want you to know you've been in remission for about a year. And he said, I've, uh, you know, you've had your wife in here. We've talked about the kids and the family. It's obvious to me that you're in remission. 
And for me then, this is a piece of the story you don't know, the reason I went to him six years previously is I wanted to stop drinking. I did not have any of the traits of an early alcoholic. I hated alcohol until I was 34 years old. And then something happened and my identity was ripped from me. And the only thing I knew was that bottle. And after about uh, 10, uh, 4 to 14, uh, uh, 8 to 10 years of that, I was done because it didn't taste good. I didn't like what it did for me. I didn't, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so it was then in December of 09 that he looked at me and he said, now you, don't have, no, you have no excuse to, to not stop drinking. He said, if you would have tried to stop drinking without us getting borderline under control, you never would have done it. The borderline would have sucked you back into the behaviors that you had. And, and I love my 12-step meetings, and I will go till the day I die, and I will practice that 12-step being there for somebody because I have seen what it has done for me. But it was filling that identity hole. And, and I don't know where you're at spirituality. You don't have to agree with anything I say, but I, I say everybody's born with a God hole because we are created by a creator, he has every right to put whatever fail safe he wants in us, and he gives us free will to accept him or reject him. So that little free will, that God hole, we fill with every single thing we can except for God. And when, for whatever reason, he chooses us or we get to the lowest point or however it turns around, then we allow that God hole to be filled, and then we truly understand what our identity is. Mm-hmm. And when you talked about identity, oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh, and I, 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 identity, I'm a husband. And so if my wife isn't treating me, now this was the way I used to be. If my wife wasn't treating me the way I saw myself as a husband, if I would see that as what? Tearing down my identity, yeah. even though I totally created it. It's not realistic. So yeah, my wife deserves sainthood. <laughs> 30 years this year. There does tend to be that kind of external focus to the identity instead of having it, you know, being yeah. confident in yourself. They tend to look towards others to kind of fill in the gaps for them. Well, I, I like what Carl always says in the meetings. That an alcoholic has an ego the size of Manhattan and self-confidence the size of a pea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that surely was me. Now. There are also situations that I've been told I'm asking a question. I mean, I know it sounds mm-hmm. like I'm making a statement. Many people who suffer from borderline are females who have been sexually assaulted or sexually uh, misused uh, in their early life. Mm-hmm. Is that true? It, yeah, there does seem to be a pattern to that. Yeah. And um, is, is that what we would uh, on the street call a daddy complex or a mommy complex? I don't necessarily think so. I I personally, and this is kind of my own view, I think it stems from the fact that when you're very young, your identity is forming, and when you are betrayed by the very adults who are supposed to be taking care of you, that kind of inhibits your ability to form good relationships for the rest of your life or trust anyone or have your own identity. Yeah. Yeah. How true. How true. I guess my question, too, is that isn't it true that an alcoholic needs to admit they are yes. before they can well what about a person that has a mental illness if they don't know it how do they get help if they're not even aware that they are they have a mental health issue such as personality disorders is yes. that well you know a lot of times when someone with a personality disorder does come in for the first time they kind of are focused on other people's reactions to them because that's kind of just their personality well it was all it was never my fault exactly i mean i mean that seriously yeah it was never my fault if these people would stop doing this how many times have we heard that in the rooms yeah yeah but i really felt that yeah well if my wife would just do this if my partner in business would just do this everything would be fine so we discuss, you know, these are the traits of who you are, and it doesn't seem like they're working very well for you. Maybe we should address that. Yeah. I just wonder how willing a person is to expose themselves, because that's what's going to happen, correct? Mm-hmm. That you are going to dig and find out, um, you know, where it all started. And um, it is hard to treat somebody who's not wanting to 
you know, be honest about what's going on or, you know, take ownership for what's going on in their life. Do you find that the closer you get to what's really going on with him, the more people push back? I mean, unconsciously, because you're getting down to what's where they what they need to find out. Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. Um, when you're getting close to something that's painful or really hitting mm-hmm. home for somebody, it sometimes can worsen their symptoms, and that will lead them to leave the therapy. Other times, that's what shows them they really need help and they feel like they're really making progress when that starts to happen. So how many people have walked out on you during (laughs) (laughs) Uh, just one so far? (laughs) Well, I'm just curious because if it gets, it gets uncomfortable, that's usually the action a person's going to take, correct? Either they'll, they'll stay till the end and they'll not come back or walk out. Uh, I'll tell you what happened. Like when I used to go to therapy, when I would get down close to what was really happening, I'd get headaches, and then things just start getting um, unclear. And that was just my defense, I think. So I didn't have to think about it. So I was thinking I wanted to get there, but unconsciously doing things, so I didn't. Lila Stafford is my co-host, along with Bob Montserrat, the cat in the hat. Lila is with Unity Point. Bob, gosh, Bob's with me. (laughs) And our special guest today is Dr. Mackle Rath. Uh, she is a psychiatrist with Unity Point, and we're talking about uh, mental disorders, depression. Um, I want to stay on the borderline a little bit longer, but then I also want to talk about bipolar, because that seems to be, I don't know, it just seems to be everywhere now. Um, we'll continue to talk to the good doctor live here. I'm J. Michael McCoy. If I haven't told you, thanks for listening. I love this job, but I couldn't do it without you. Right here on The Truth, 99.3. Powered by webcast1live.com. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wonderscheid. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us. 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed. Fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fixing the problem today, if they have another problem five days down the road, it's still fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are going to give you an exact to the penny price on what it's going to take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, You come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu and some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile? That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about, is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. (laughs) We have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. 
If you're not happy, we're going to make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. Restoring hope. Open my heart to sing. Taking the darkness inside. Revealing your light. Restoring hope. Good afternoon. We are so pleased you're joining us today on The Truth 99.3 and webcast1live.com. This is Restoring Hope Live, starring Lila uh, Stafford uh, as my co-host, along with Bob Montserrat, the cat in the hat, watching the chat. Ryan's producing, and I'm J. Michael McCoy, and I sure appreciate you spending uh, this part of your day with us. Uh, we're talking about important issues, and that is mental health. Uh, I want to go back to the borderline thing for just a second and then move on. Bob, you said something really interesting. Um, uh, you were kind of asking Dr. Uh, McElrath about um, how does someone admit that they have these issues? Okay. Correct. I can only speak for myself. Uh, I was so sick and tired of being so sick and tired of losing friends um uh, i remember one of my turning points was when i read that the pew organization said that every man had 0.7 friends he could call in the middle of the night and i said to my wife one day after sharing that with her because i'm always trying to say i'm okay i'm okay look 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 i said honey i've got tens and tens and tens of guys that I can call on in the middle of the night. And my wife looked at me with that look. You've got that look, Lila. I've seen you look at people that way. She looked at me and she said, they all work for you. Of course they're uh. there. And when it came down to it, I had nobody. I had nobody. And that really, I got goosebumps. That really hit me. And it was, it was of course I had nobody. I always knew I had nobody, but it was never my fault. Now I realized it's my fault. There's got to be something wrong with me. And so that's when I sought my doctor out. Uh, uh, I asked my doctor one time, why did I go into remission? Because what it, it doesn't happen very often in borderline. It's very hard to give up. I mean, you probably know how hard you had to work in therapy to kind of yeah. address all of the things that go along with the borderline personality. It's yeah. difficult. And uh, um, because we had been, my wife and I had been with a therapist prior to that and had seen her three or four years. And my, after I got diagnosed from the other doctor and he and I began the therapy, my wife asked this therapist, did you know Mac had borderline? Oh, yes, she said. I've known that for years. And so CJ said, well, why didn't you tell him? Well, you can't tell a borderline that they have uh -huh. Borderline, right? That's kind of what you and I are talking about. If you walk up to somebody who's got borderline and say, listen, honey, I love you to death, but there is something for what you ail, all the frustrations and pain and of desertion and forlorn, and, it, and it's, all, it's here. It's called borderline, and we can treat this, that they immediately run and say, it's not me, it's you. If you would just do this the way I want it done, then I'd be fine. And my therapist... Um, I'm not going to give his name. Uh, he was a boots on the ground ranger from Vietnam. And he said, uh, a good Catholic boy. And he said that God would not let me give up on you. You have no idea how many times I'd go home and I'd tell my wife about this patient of mine that just would not get it. Kept giving excuse after excuse after excuse. And he said God would just gentle his mind in the middle of it and say, I, Max, for you, you got to deal with this. And sure enough, he busted me. And boy, when he busted me, I cried like a puppy for two years. When I realized all of a sudden all the things that I had done to my wife and my family and my parents. And oh, my God. Pushing them away. Pushing them away. Mm -hmm. and, and the highs and the lows and just crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, thank you for what you do and not giving up on the patients that come before you because... Uh, you really are our last line of defense. Somebody who can further can uh, further themselves from the patient, but yet still understand 
everything that the patient is going through. I have a question I want to ask you. Me? Um, or no, her? Okay. The doctor. Um, the subject is suicide. And how do you know? Are there signs that you know if, they're, if they really are threatening? I mean, I know that we're supposed to ask if they have a plan, but um, if, someone is, if someone keeps talking about it, should they be in a hospital setting? Um, it just scares me to be around people that are talking that way. Well, it's, it's impossible to predict human behavior or know exactly what is going on in someone's mind beyond what they're telling you. Um, some people have chronic suicidal thoughts that um, they can deal with and they never act on them. Others never speak to anyone about it and have an act, so mm -hmm. it's, it's very hard to tell. Some signs that we look for to determine to the best of our abilities, whether or not somebody is a danger or access to access to means, past mm -hmm. attempts, um, other things such as being male, single, old, older. So if they've had past attempts. Well, if I wasn't married, I'd fit that, wouldn't I? <laughs> wow. <laughs> if they've had past attempts, then, then that's kind of a prediction. It's one of the few indicators that we would look at, but again, it's impossible to yeah. to know for sure, unfortunately. Well, and um, I, I constantly thought about it, but it was never, a, oh, woe is me. It was a, how can I do this to hurt the fewest amount of people? Everything from disappearing planning it for months, disappearing, and going somewhere where, I don't know, they wouldn't know me, they wouldn't, you know, whatever. Um, I thought about, uh, and I'm, this is so unfair to anybody else, but I thought about the semi-truck suicide, where your car is just parked on the side of the interstate, and the trucks are going down 70 mile an hour, oh. and you're under your hood looking, and when that truck comes, you just take two steps to your right. Ooh. I had a gun in the house. I tell people that you'll never get the taste of gun oil out of your mouth. I can still taste it today. But I don't think I ever would have done it. But yet I, I, ne I never told anybody that I was going to do it. Mm -hmm. I never. Is this a crappy thing to say? Oh, good. I'm going to say it and then ask it's a crappy thing to say. <laughs> people who try to commit suicide and don't accomplish it are just trying to get attention? Is that, is that way too rough on them? Well, some people are upset that they weren't successful and are genuinely depressed, and other people, I mean, there's just so much variation between certain situations. Some people, it would appear they're trying to get attention. They have a very non-lethal attempt or something that's pretty yeah. minor. So it, it's depression that's usually underneath that? Or just other chemical things that are happening in their brain. I guess I'm I'm just trying to understand people that well, are it's attempting. A, it's it. a long term solution to a short term problem. It's a long term solution to a mm -hmm. short term problem. Yeah. So did I say yeah. that right? Is that right? Yeah, but that's kind of too rational for somebody that's. I mean, well, I don't I, think people can really think, th if you're in that state, well, then, I don't think they can think through, they can't think through this. They're not, no, no not usually thinking yeah. very logically. We always take a three-pronged approach to any diagnosis or treatment plan. We look at the biological factors, mm -hmm. the psychological factors, and the social factors. And in different patients, each one of those factors has different weight. Yeah. Sometimes it's more biological for some people, and sometimes it's more of the social factors, what's going on in their life. It just varies. All right, when we come back, uh, we're on our last break. We'll come back with eight and a half minutes. I want to talk about bipolar. Uh, what is it? Uh, how can we easily spot it? If we can't spot it easily, what do we need to get the person to do so they can be clinically diagnosed, so they can begin to get the medicines? And why, in heaven's sakes, do so many bipolar people don't take their meds? I don't get that. We'll talk about that with Dr. 
McElrath from Unity Point Hospitals across the land. I'm J. Michael McCoy. Thanks for listening here to The Truth 99.3, powered by webcastonelive.com. A father who is headed toward another heart attack. A woman who struggles daily with diabetes and her memory. A boy whose headaches keep him out of school. A mother who one morning discovers a lump. A girl whose condition defies diagnosis. You come to us because you need answers, but you also need more. You need understanding of what you're going through. You need comfort. You need to be treated as an individual, not a condition. You need to be included in your own care. You are the point of everything we do. That's why we're changing to Unity Point Health. It's a model of care that will help us work better together, where the physician who knows you best takes the lead, coordinating your care through every step, from the hospital to specialists, to rehabilitation, to health services in the home and in the community, to making sure the treatments are effective. By working as a team, we surround you with care, helping you manage your health and your conditions guiding you to making better choices and living a healthier life. The point of unity is you. Unity Point Health. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can give these grandkids back but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We can help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Darkness inside, revealing your light, restoring hope. Good afternoon, Dr. McElrath is my guest today. She is a, a clinical psychologist, uh, I'm sorry, clinical psychiatrist uh, with Unity Point Health here in town. Uh, this is Restoring Hope Live, and we're talking about mental illness. Um, let's go to, um, what did I say we we're going to talk about? Bipolar. Bipolar. Thank you. Uh, bipolar. I'm a six-year-old. Describe it to me. Mommy has bipolar. What, 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 what does she do that I'm noticing? If you need to make me eight, that's okay. <laughs> bipolar disorder is alternating periods of deep depressions, sadness, not sleeping, not eating, that sort of thing. And then at least one period of um, manic episode where you're not sleeping for a few days, you don't miss the sleep got lots of energy doing lots of projects repainting the house in two days kind of mm. things and and that's a chemical imbalance yes that is not a uh disorder that is a disease yes yes um do medicines almost always work there's a i would say a pretty high success rate for uh, medicines and bipolar disorder. What's bipolar depression? I've seen the ads on TV for that medication, but I, I didn't. What is it? It's just the depressed phase of a bipolar illness. Okay. Okay. Now, um, it seems to me from being on the outside looking in that bipolar patients are most likely, I'm sorry, least likely to take their medications. They're off their meds. They're off their meds. They're off their meds. Well, for a bipolar patient who's experienced a manic episode, part of what goes along with that oftentimes is euphoric mood, mm -hmm. very, very happy mood, and the, the manic phase feels good. So it's hard to keep them to taking their medicines when they like the mania. But, but why, don't they f can't, why can't they figure out that the manic is partly because of the medicines? Or is it? Maybe that's a wrong statement is caused by the medicines yeah the good feelings no. um hopefully the medications would prevent the mania if they're properly okay. medicated yeah all right 
And so they don't take them because they think they're okay without them then. Look how good I feel. So I yeah. don't need my pills. They Oftentimes, want that high. Yeah. They huh? want they want the high is what they want from the from oh. you know, they don't want it they don't like the depression part, but the other side is the high that you get and for many of them, I mean, you're whizzing around doing all kinds of stuff and they love it until they have, you know, a lot they of crash. days and then yeah. And then, and then after it's over, then they wish they had taken it. But during the time, and they're, they're, my experience has been with working with some of them, is that they don't want that middle ground. They don't want to feel in, like... Balanced. It, balanced. Yeah. They want the high, and we understand wanting the high. Yeah, absolutely. That made sense, though. So where does bipolar come from? I mean, we talked about borderline. That's an association of something when you were young bipolar is just born into you and you have a chemical imbalance yeah it, it often runs in families so it's genetic at least in some component yeah okay likely has bipolar been around a long time i mean is this a forever thing with humans i think so yeah okay there are some um people who speculate that even some of the artists and great writers from the past oh yeah um did their best work when they were feeling manic so. yeah i would agree with that um we've talked about a series of mental illnesses today and i sure appreciate your time you've been great i hope you choose to come back sometime what 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 is something that my listeners need to know about mental illness that, that that for some reason never gets said never gets pushed hard enough not it, you just don't get it if you knew this about mental illness you could deal with those people much better and and have a more peaceful life for your own well i think a lot of people take personal responsibility for whatever mental illness symptoms they may be having they kind of feel like it's their fault and they don't seek out help because they feel like they should be able to just toughen up and get better on their own so mm. letting them know that talking to their doctor about whatever symptoms they're having um, can get them in with a psychiatrist or a therapist and they may and there's no shame in it no i think that's well, well see what she just said mate that you just hit a light bulb on for me when i figured out no let me back up when i wanted to be rid of borderline was when i realized it wasn't my fault mm-hmm now, that doesn't mean my side of the street wasn't dirty for the rest of the days. But when he was all but when my guy was able to help me understand that I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. I was a victim and nobody meant to do what they did to me. But that's just what it was. Then I really could get better. Yeah. Rather than oh, I'm just sick in my head and that only drugs are going to make me feel better. I can understand why I wouldn't want to take my pills if that was. You're broken, you know, and the only way you're going to be right is to take your pills. Hmm. Go ahead. No, I, I wasn't saying anything, but I was thinking something very strong. <laughs> Did you pick that up? Yeah. I, I, when I was in Florida, I had someone call me. I don't know who he was, but just um, he was in a manic state and just saying he, I don't know why he called me or how he got my number, but he, he didn't want to go to the hospital because he said he's been going to the hospitals his whole life and he's tired of psychiatrists he's tired of psychologists he's tired of medications so what could i tell him to do you know what that, do you tell him to do well i try to sympathize with people about how it can get tiring to take medications and have the side effects and and all of that but then we look at kind of the pros and cons of what what's working or not working for you right now with no medications or no treatment and I try to be very collaborative and see what we can agree on to work toward to That's get kind better. of how I talked to him, and then we came to the idea that he did need some help, and um, and maybe somebody could help him in a different way than he's been helped before. But it was a strange call. Did you visit uh, some 12-step meetings and things like that when you were going through your residency? I did, yes. What, what, what was something that you found glaringly positive about 12-step programs? They were all very supportive of each other, um, open with sharing their experiences. Nobody was judgmental of anybody else, and they um, all, it was an atmosphere of genuine caring for each other and wanting to help each other get better. Thank you. I would agree with you. No, no judgment. Um, 
do you find groups um, in, in, in the care of uh, medical professionals who don't support each other, who, don't, who do judge each other without the 12 steps to follow? Group therapies, other yeah. group therapies that aren't 12 step yeah. based. Yeah. Um, if there's a good facilitator, hopefully they don't devolve into judgments or, or things like that. Um, yeah. Well, I sure appreciate you coming in today. Thank you very much. Thanks for your husband and your two darling daughters at home. And uh, thanks for doing the work you do. From one guy who's been there, I, I really love you. And I appreciate the time that you put in to help people like me get well. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, light up, Bob. We'll see you next week. Until I see you again, would you do me a favor and just forgive somebody? They're living in your brain. They're poisoning your brain. Bring it up. Give it to Jesus. Just forgive. I'll see you tomorrow. Restoring hope.